start and just remind uh, everyone that's here. Uh, this is a DAP chat presented by the Draft Animal Power Network. Um, and we're a nonprofit. Uh, who, I'm going to read the mission because I, I cannot find better words. But uh, Draft Animal Power Network provides connection to resources that preserve and advance the use of draft animals in the working landscape. And this is why tonight we have Christina Hansen, um, who's here to talk about what she does in New York City with horses and what, how she came um, to this um, work and workplace um, and also, my name is Daphne, and I'm from Quebec, so that's why I have a huge accent. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> um, so I know you had a PowerPoint. Well, maybe you had a PowerPoint or pictures. <laughs> I've got some pictures. I've got, you know, some PowerPoints. I also, you know, want to be, I kind of want this to, to be a chat, you know, because, you know, yeah. I, I don't want to just lecture about this because I, I could, I do it all the time. <laughs> um, but, you know, to sort of, uh, I want to sort of do a little bit of a presentation first and kind of run through kind of an overview of what we do, share some pictures, um, maybe even share some videos, but, um, yes. you know, but I, I, mean, I want to answer people's questions um, because I know that this is one of those things that I get questions about. Oh, that's a good one all the time and they don't necessarily people don't necessarily have a carriage driver to talk to so right oh and that reminds me um if you have questions oh i'm talking to everyone else but if you have questions you can either raise your hand or uh write in the chat um your question if you don't want to speak and i can read it out loud uh, i'll make sure i follow this uh, so do you want to start with your presentation then yeah <laughs> yep so um let me pull this up here. Hang on one second. Um, anyway. You might have to claim host. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I might have to claim host. Yeah, okay. I'll just send you. This is how you, this is the password. Hang on a second. I'm trying to. Seven eight seven one four. Um, actually, I, you would think that after all these years of doing Zoom, that I would be better at this. <laughs> um, I don't do know. You need um, I was just gonna share my screen, but I was trying to do. Um, ah, yeah, the host disabled participant screen sharing. So, yeah, you can claim host. I just sent you the key. All right, how do I, sorry, I'm. <laughs> oh, I'm making you host. I made you host. Okay, there, I'm just making you host now. <laughs> you All right. So. Um... I'm new to this as well, so we're oh, all. Uh, yeah, you know, like, I mean, I, I'm a All character. working animals, <laughs> not too serious. All working animals, you know, not. Um, so. Um, Let me just share my screen here. There you go. All right. So, <laughs> let me go. so, um, so I, I can everybody see my like PowerPoint here. <laughs> that works. All right. So, um, my name is Christina Hansen. I'm a New York City carriage driver. I grew up in Lexington, Kentucky, horse capital of the world. And um, I've been driving a carriage now in Central Park for 12 years. Uh, I used to drive a carriage in Philadelphia. So all together now, I've been driving carriages for 18 years. Um, and I'm also the uh, sort of carriage industry spokesperson. I have been uh, representing us to the media on TV, um, actually since before I was a carriage driver in New York City. 
I consider myself a working horse advocate. Um, when I worked in Philadelphia, I worked with Pamela Rickenbach, uh, who's a carriage driver there, to start a draft horse uh, sanctuary, Blue Star Aquaculture, in 2009 that provides retirement homes for uh, carriage horses and other working horses um, and other you know, uh, homeless and disabled horses. And uh, Pam still continues on that work in, in uh, Massachusetts um, with Anam Cara Farm. Um, so I, I, you know, now I am the chief shop steward for TW Local 100, who is, um, uh, represents the um, carriage drivers in uh, New York City. So I work with four horses in New York City. Uh, I've got uh, Billy, who you see in the uh, selfie with me there. He is a uh, standard bred. Um, I have King, uh, Billy's 21, Canadian standard bred. I have King, who is 25. Um, he's been doing this now for 21 years, 12 with me. Uh, Oreo spotted draft. Um, he is 18, he's been doing this for 13 years. And Sherman, who's the baby, and uh, he's been here for about a year and a half. Um, I just wanted to start with, you know, my mother's a journalist. And, you know, there's the questions, the who, what, when, where, how, and most importantly, why of what we do. So the carriage industry in New York City is not just people like me who's, who are carriage drivers, um, and carriage owners, but it's a lot of different people. So uh, we have about 150 licensed carriage drivers in New York City, um, but we also have three stables, um, two of which are private, are single owners uh, owned by a single carriage family, and one is owned by 15 carriage owners. They're actually also uh, collectively together. Uh, we have the stablemen who take care of our horses. We have 24-7 stablemen. We have sweepers who work in the park um, who sweep up after the horses. Of course, we have our veterinarians. We work with several large uh, animal equine vets. Uh, right now, primarily Dr. Camilla Sierra and uh, Dr. Gabe Cook and Dr. Sam Bropes. Uh, Dr. Cook and Dr. Bropes are out of New England Equine. Um, which is a full service veterinary hospital located about an hour and a half um, from the city. Um, they come down to the city every two weeks to do paperwork for the horses. Our horses get twice annual checkups. Um, Dr. Sierra is based on Long Island and he's available for emergency calls. We also have a horse trailer who can uh, that we can take our horses to the hospital. Um, so it, everybody here, I'm sure, knows that there's a shortage of large animal vets. Um, but we are very lucky to have the vets that we do, do you know, to all the possible diagnostic and 24 emergent, 24 hour emergency care. Um, and you know, so so we are lucky to have that. Um, even though we are located in you know this huge city in Manhattan. Um, of course, our farriers, uh, we have uh, farriers that come in to the city. Each carriage owner is um, able to pick which uh, farriers they want to use. We have some of our stablemen shoe. Um, we have a couple of farriers who come in from Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, once a week to shoe horses. Um, so we have a very strong connection with um, Pennsylvania. Uh, TW Local 100 is our union, um, and they are also the largest local in Manhattan. So really, when you start looking out to that, they represent, you know, other tourism industries like the double-decker buses, the um, circle line. Well, they're trying to mobilize the ferries and other uh, tourism industry aspects, but they also most importantly represent the MTA. So all four, it's a 40,000 member local. So now we're talking about subways and buses and and this whole other thing that we stand in solidarity with them. Um, of course, we have our horse transporters all over the New York City carriage horses go on vacation for five weeks out of the year. Um, and when they go on vacation, they're going on turnout. So of course we have all the farm animal, uh, farm owners. We have farms in New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, upstate New York that these horses go to. And so they're connected into our industry. 
Um, we have horse, uh, you know, suppliers, people that we buy horses from. Um, we also have our harness makers. We mostly work with Zimmerman's Harness in um, Leola, Pennsylvania, and also our carriage builders, Troyer, Raber out in Indiana, um, and then places like Whitmer Coach Shop in PA uh, that also provide our repairs. And of course, most importantly, our horses. So um, we, at any given time in New York City, have about 200, 220 licensed carriage horses, um, mostly drafts, draft crosses, and standard breads. Our horses, if anybody's familiar with, um, you know, other carriage industries, uh, we are, our horses tend not to be as large as um, other businesses um, where they've got 18 hand Percherons and, 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 and Belgians. Uh, we do have a few full bred draft horses, but they tend to be the smaller kind of farmy horses that are a little bit more compact, you know, in the 16 to 17 hand range. Um, because we just simply don't have as much room in New York City as uh, we do in um, as, they, as they do in other parts of the world. Um, so we are, you know, providing carriage rides, um, which are thousand pound carriages. We have a maximum a capacity of four adults or three adults and two kids under the age of 12. Uh, so these are really not, we don't need an 1800, you know, 18 hand hitch horse. Um, so we do use a lot of half drafts, you know, Pertron Morgan crosses, what we call the Amish warm blood, the Pertron standard bread cross. Um, a lot of standard breads, too large standard breads. Like my horse, Billy, is a 17 plus hand, like 17 two hand standard breads, one of the biggest standard breads I've ever seen. So he has no trouble uh, pulling the carriage in the park. So um, we so what do we do? We provide these carriage rides in Central Park, um, which has been designed for carriages um, since the very beginning, since Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted designed it in 1858. We also do rides in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, the regulations in New York City say that we cannot work um, in the streets until in the evenings after nine o'clock at night. Uh, we can go down to Rockefeller Center, provide rides there. Um, and of course, we do do special jobs. We do weddings. Um, some of my coworkers do funerals in New York City um, and other special events like that. So the when, <laughs> brief <laughs> history of New York City carriages, brief 400 history. Now I've given a talk that takes about an hour and a half, about 400 years of history in uh, New York City. I'm not gonna do that tonight because I do wanna leave plenty of time for us <laughs> to discuss. Um, but the wish, another time. <laughs> <laughs> another time, yeah. So um, so carriage, well, horses have been on Manhattan. You know, one of the things that I hear all the time is, you know, how do you keep a horse in Manhattan? Well, the same way, more or less, that they've been here since 1625. So May of 1625. Um, this is, in fact, the earliest known uh, image of New York City, what is now New York City. Uh, this is from the summer of 1625. And what you have is um, Dutch Fort Amsterdam there, some windmills. Um, you've got your Lenape and their canoes. You've got the Dutch and the boats and little houses. And then these three ships over here are actually bringing 103 Frisian horses to what is now New York City. So horses have been here for a very long time. Um, you know why Frisian? Horses? Well, because well, because that's what they had in the Dutch Low Country. I mean, that's literally the Netherlands includes Frisian, uh, Friesland rather. And so the what are the ancestors, the 17th century ancestors of um, 
the modern Frisian were these black horses from the Low Countries. Uh, if you look at, um, you know, the Dutch sent these horses over. And if you look at, say, the state seal of Pennsylvania, um, which has the two rampant horses on it, they're black. They're supposed to be Conestoga horses, but those horses were descended from the horses that uh, the Dutch sent over to New Netherland, uh, which stretched from up here in, in New York all the way down to um, New Jersey and what is now Philadelphia's, you know, that region. Um, as a matter of fact, um, the Hudson, the Dutch called it the North River. And we think of like, oh, well, it's the North River compared to like the East River. The Dutch called it the North River, but the South River was the Delaware. So this whole region was influenced by this import of um, Dutch horses in the 17th century Frisians. Um, so, so there were 103 horses. They settled here. The development of New York City would not have been possible without um, these these Frisians, which of course were more farm horses. Um, but really, we're a history of cabs. I mean, we think of Central Park as being, um, you know, this place. It was actually designed for carriage driving by Olmsted, uh, but we have actually been licensed and regulated by the city of New York since 1692. The first permit from the King of England to drive a hat coach was issued to then to a coach owner who had a coach down by the Bowery and he had a tavern. And so he had permission to charge people money to drive them from point A to point B. And that's where our business comes from. Uh, we are horse-drawn cabs. The license plate on the back of my carriage says horse-drawn cab. Um, and we've had our uh, rates regulated by the city since at least 1813. And that kind of becomes important with our business today, uh, which is that the city sets the rates that we're allowed to charge. Uh, I had a long conversation just this week at the Carriage Operators in North America's convention, um, because our business is so different from most other commercial carriage operators, whether they're fleets in other cities or private wedding operators, where they set their price based on what they need to get the job done and what the market will bear. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that option. Um, our rates were set by the city. Now, since 2010, they've been tied to the Consumer Price Index. But prior to 2010, any time our rate changed, a law had to be passed in New York City saying how much people could pay or were legally allowed to charge and the maximum rate that we could receive. Um, so horse-drawn cabs, you know, we had various types. The um, I just like this picture of Grand Central um, terminal um, before it became Grand Central Station, uh, because you've got like various horse transportation here. You've got your horse-drawn omnibuses. You've got the four-wheel hackney cabs or hackney coaches. Um, and then you've also got the handsome cab, uh, which was invented in the 1850s by English architect Joseph Hansom. Um, what's interesting is that a lot of people in New York City use the term horse-drawn carriage, horse-drawn cab, and handsome cab interchangeably, even though we do not have any handsome cabs in daily use. We have vis-a-vis, -vis, which are four-seat carriages, um, open-top carriages. but And then we've been operating originally... Um, outside of the park. Uh, this is Grand Army Plaza at the southeastern corner of Central Park. Uh, this was hack, this was cab stand 16. This picture is from around 19, it's the 19 teens, 1920s. But you can see the horses lined up here on the southern end of the park. We now stand in the park. Um, but we've been giving rides all over town 
And so by the 1920s, though, there were only a handful of horse-drawn cabs left. They were quickly replaced by motorized cabs starting in the 1890s. Um, there were basically obituaries written in the New York Times about horse-drawn cabs in New York City that the young people today only want um, very quick um, automobiles, and bigger the better and the faster the better. So there were actually, this, this gentleman, John Otterman retired after, you know, uh, 50 years in the business. His horse there is in his, um, the horse is in his 20s too. I think he's 28 and had been a cab horse for him for like 23 years. And so it was kind of the, uh, that, that at this point in the 20s, there were only about 16 or 17 uh, carriages, horse-drawn cabs operating in um, New York City. This is, typical Victoria that we had operating in the park all the way from the origins of it in the 1850s on up until the, um, really the, the 1970s. <laughs> uh, these, ca these Victorias were kept around um, as they were until they started to fall apart. Um, in 1935, um, Fiorello LaGuardia, though, introduced the Hass Act, which here in New York City is what gave the yellow cabs their medallions. Prior to this time, you had horse-drawn cabs who were licensed by the city. It was optional. Other people had private vehicles. You had cars. There were private taxi fleets that belonged to hotels or train stations, both motorized and horse-drawn. And in the 1930s, LaGuardia said, that's it. You can't have a cab unless you have a license from the city. And for $10, you could get one of these 14,000 licenses and you could put them on either a horse-drawn cab or a motorized cab. And you could actually switch them back and forth. <laughs> and um, people did that, you know, these, these 15, 16 carriage operators. Then by the Great Depression, there were a few more because, you know, uh, gasoline prices, cars were expensive and they were switching them back and forth. And then when World War II happened is really kind of when the modern carriage industry happened. There was gas rationing. You had all these GIs coming in from um, all across the country before they were shipped off to Europe or North Africa. And they had a few days of leave before they got on a boat. And so there was this massive influx for basically tourism. People wanted to see the park, maybe with a pretty girl you know, before being shipped out. And so there were um, lots of folks who were coming up here. So there was an impetus to actually switch back to cabs, to horses rather, rather than motorized cabs with the gas rationing, with this tourism. And um, it was actually during the 40s that the carriage people said, we got to have a different rate structure from the motorized cabs. You got to separate us out we can't do it for what the cabs do it. We're doing a very different thing. We're doing tours of the park. Um, we need a different rate structure. So it was in the forties that these two businesses went their separate ways, the motorized cabs and the horse-drawn cabs. Um, and at the end of the war, the city said, you can't go back and forth anymore. That's just too confusing. Pick one. And 68, cab owners, horse-drawn cab owners said, we like the horses. We're going to stay with them. And we've had 68 horse-drawn cabs ever since in New York City. That's how many we have today. Uh, they, um, right after the war, is really like you had 68 separate little carriage owners, these guys who wanted to keep um, the carriages. As those guys started retiring in the 50s and 60s, they, those medallions got bought, those licenses got up, bought up by carriage stable owners largely. And you started to have big fleets of carriages by the 1960s um, where a stable owner might own like um, Anastasia who owned 38th street stable um, had like 26 ca uh, carriages and Buster McGill at Chateau stable had 13 carriage medallions. And so these carriage owners needed to hire people. And so it was in the late 60s that you had the first women carriage uh, operators hired. 
Um, you had a lot of college students being hired um, by the 70s. And then, of course, you had lots of um, Irish immigrants in the 80s who came here during the Troubles, um, who started driving carriages. And then when those fleet owners kind of started to retire a little bit themselves, they started to sell off those medallions in the 70s and 80s to the drivers. And so those kind of who the people are that drive the carriages today. Um, so you went back to kind of single ownership. Um, the breakdown of carriage drivers has sort of changed between, um, it used to be almost all Irish and Italians. Um, and now we have, you know, we joke and say that whoever's the shop steward or the president of the Horse and Carriage Association is not the president. We're actually the secretary general because we have people from all over the world in the carriage business now. Uh, we have um, lots of Turkish um, immigrants who've bought up a lot of carriages now, young guys with kids, um, Mexican carriage drivers, Russians, uh, Brazilians, literally from all over the world. I'm actually an anomaly in that I'm I'm from the United States. Uh, we only have a handful of uh, native born Americans and most of the native born Americans in our business are first generation Americans whose fathers were in the carriage business. So just putting up a very briefly a picture of Ed Koch here, who's the mayor of New York in the late seventies and most of the eighties um, because our regulations in New York City that I'm gonna talk about when I talk about how we do all this, it uh, really came in when he was mayor. Um, the modern animal rights movement started in 1980 when PETA was founded. Um, we have been regulated and licensed by and inspected by the ASPCA since the ASPCA was founded in 1866. But things started to change in the 1980s when people started to have questions, I guess you could say, about the use of animals at all, especially in cities as people became more disconnected from horses um, and from farming, especially in a place like New York. I mean, New York City had milk wagon horses till the 1930s. We had um, vegetable cart horses on it. There was a guy in Brooklyn who delivered vegetables with a pony until the early 80s. We had junk wagon horses in the 60s. Um, but by the 70s and 80s, the horses were starting to fade out. Uh, it was not something that people in the city were as familiar with as they had been just a few decades earlier. Uh, and so in 1981, the Rental Horse Licensing and Protection Law was passed, which began the foundation of a lot of the regulations that we still follow today in terms of temperature restrictions, what kind of stable conditions have to be like, um, you know, working hours for the horses, veterinary inspections. This all started in 1981. Our hoof numbers on our horses, how we keep track of everybody. Just wanted to show a picture here of one of our medallions. This is pretty much the same style of plate that we have for this is zoomed in from this picture, which is from the 80s. Um, so back to the, that's kind of the win, a brief history. We've been doing this for a really long time. Carriages have been operating in Central Park since 1858 when the park opened. Um, we operate in the park, of course, when our horses are at work. And when they're at home, they're in stables over in Hell's Kitchen on the west side. And then every, like I said earlier, every New York City carriage horse spends at least five weeks on vacation outside of the city uh, every year. Um, do you have pictures of the stables? Like I'm I do have pictures of the stables. So that's where we're going now because that's what everybody kind of wants uh, to know. <laughs> um, these are two of the stables down on 37th and 38th Street. Um, they're literally right next to the Hudson Yards. Um, these stables were built as stables in the 19th century. Um, stable on... Um, West 37th Street belongs to this gentleman here. This is Neil Burns. Um, this he, His father was in the carriage business. Um, his stable was um, built around 1900, and, uh, 1910. It's actually the newest of the three stables. It's the smallest of the three stables. It has 
um, six of the 68 carriages in it and about, you know, 12, 13 horses. Um, but it was the first stable to actually have um, box stalls in the city prior to the 80s when Neil put in the uh, box stalls in his stable. Uh, all the horses in New York City lived in standing stalls, tie stalls. Um, we are now mandated to have box stalls. And every New York City carriage horse um, lives in a box stall that is at least 60 feet square feet and at least seven feet wide, uh, the smallest dimension, seven feet. So the small, absolute smallest that a New York City carriage um, stall or stall can be is a seven by like eight and a half feet or so. Um, most of the stalls in our stables are about eight by 10. This is the stable where my horses live. This is West Side Livery Stable. This stable was built um, around 1900. It's been in continuous operation as a stable. Um, and of course, I got to mention the one thing. I, it seems obvious, but um, I do have to mention it. Our horses live upstairs. This is a wonderful book. Um, if anybody, um, I'm holding up to the camera. I'm screen sharing at the same time. I apologize. But The Horse Who Lived Upstairs, it's a children's book from the 1940s. Um, horses in New York City live upstairs, just like everybody else. Space is at a premium. Um, and what we have at the 38th Street stables, and there you can see Neil's stable in the background here, is that um, you have the carriages on the ground floor, and then horses here live on the second and third floors, and then um, the hay on this stable is uh, kept on the fourth floor. Um, so this building is actually, and there's uh, 17 carriages that work out of the stable and about 35 horses. Um, and so this stable is actually gravity driven. <laughs> once we get the hay up here, which isn't an easy task, hard work, but once you get the hay in the hay loft, the stableman can drop the hay through our, um, down to the third floor. They can use our manure chute to drop it down to the second floor, feed all the horses, and then when they muck, they can muck here into the aisle. And I'll show you a picture of the interior in just a second. And then they can muck into the manure chute and then drop it down to the second floor and then eventually down to the ground floor where we have dumpsters and private sanitation picks up our manure. So this whole thing, and Le Corbusier said a, a, a house is a machine for living in. This stable is a machine for keeping horses in. Uh, it was designed for horses. Uh, for people to keep them there. A couple of interior shots. This is Tony Salerno. He is the stable manager at the stable. These are actually, this is Oreo that I was talking about earlier and King. Um, so box stalls, these stalls were all built by Tony and the stableman when the stable converted to box stalls in 2010. Um, before then it had approximately six foot wide tie stalls. Now they're, you know, eight, nine foot wide stalls, 10 feet deep. Um, the New York City lots are 25 by 100 in most places, which is actually, you've got 10 feet with like a four foot aisle and then room for the walls. So it's actually, so you got two 10 foot stalls and a four foot walkway in these uh, stables. You'll still see old stables all over town, but they're, they're, they're the right size for horses. When they laid out the grid and the lots in 1811, they didn't make, you know, lots that were unsuitable for horses because they were keeping horses on a, in a lot of these um, 25 by 100 foot lots. So um, they could have made them a different size if horses wouldn't fit in them. So they've kind of, the splits of our streets, the size of our lots, all kept in mind with horses. Um, you know, there's Oreo again. You can kind of see a little bit more of the type of stable we have. We have fans. Um, all of our stables have our 24 hour a day stablemen who take care of the um, mucking, haying, watering. And then we move uptown a little bit closer to the park. Uh, this is Clinton Park Stables on West 52nd Street. Um, this is the largest of the three carriage stables. It houses two thirds of the business. Um, so it's got 45 carriages here 
and it's got 90 horses living on the second and third um, floors. So I I think I have a question now. <laughs> yeah, go right ahead. I love questions. <laughs> I have so many. But uh, how do you keep how do you get the horses from one stair to the other? Yeah, you so might we have ramps. <laughs> um we have ramps. I don't think I got a picture of the ramp. I have to get a picture of the ramp. I know I've got them. Hang on. Um so let me see if I can. Let me go find pictures of the ramps. I had one here just a minute. Ago. Um, but yes, and there are ramps between the two between the floors. So the horses literally go up the ramp from the ground floor to the second floor and from the second floor to the third floor. Um, the stable at 52nd Street, when it was built, it was actually built for the Department of Sanitation, um, Department of Street Cleaning. And when it was built, it actually had horses living in the basement and horses living on the second floor. And that way the horses were only one ramp away from being outside. Um, I believe if anybody might remember the old Claremont Riding Academy on 89th Street here, they had horses downstairs, horses up on the second floor, and they had a riding ring on the ground floor. Um, the stable on 52nd Street had, um, originally had 180 horses living in it. Now we've got 90 because um, the stalls are twice as big. Uh, and they actually would not have been living on the third floor. The third floor had been strictly for hay and equipment and other things. And when um, the stable was converted back into a stable by the carriage owners in 2003, they knew they weren't gonna put horses in the basement, um, but they wanted to have the op option to put horses on the third floor, uh, which they now do. And they got a building permit from the city to put in a second ramp. And the city gave them all kinds of hassle because they were like, well, it's not ADA compliant. And they had to explain to the city zoning department that no, we're talking about horses climbing the ramp. Uh, just as they would a hill, we're not talking about people in wheelchairs going up um, up the ramp. So I'm going to find um, my ramp picture here. Uh, la 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 la. I just had. Maybe I can ask you another question while you do yeah, that. Yeah, feel free. I find my my ramp picture. Um. So you don't you drive from the stable to the park and that you're allowed to do that or do you have a car or like a, a pickup trailer yes a trailer so this is an excellent question um and it's actually one that i get asked all the time which is do you trailer the horses to and from the park and my answer because i watch trailer safety <laughs> lectures and stuff like that and the horrors of various trailer accidents is oh god no uh we <laughs> actually um drive through the park uh through the streets um the stables are between a mile and a mile and a half from the park and um the thing about driving in traffic in manhattan is that the average traffic speed in um midtown manhattan is less than seven miles an hour it's actually um, slower than it was in, um, it's actually slower than it was in 1890. <laughs> so um, we are in slow moving traffic. Um, one of the reasons we use standard breads and standard bread crosses is because um, they're more maneuverable in traffic. So they're, we're able to kind of like change lanes more quickly. We're able to kind of keep up with traffic a little bit better than a very slow plodding plow horse who takes, you know, an hour to get that mile and a half from down on 37th or 8th street um, compared to like a half hour for a lighter horse who walks faster. Um, I did find um, a one of my um various ramp pictures that's uh billy on the ramp at 38th street uh, that is um fire hose 
So uh, that's sections of fire hose that, of course, is rubber lined and it's got a canvas covering that gives the horses uh, traction on the ramp. And um, you'll notice Billy here is this is not my horse, Billy. This is a different Billy standard bread. I mean, Percheron. Um, that um, he's coming down the ramp by himself. When the stablemen get really busy in the morning, they help us get the horses ready. They will groom and harness. They know everybody's harness. And if it's very busy, they will just send the horse down the ramp and be like, hey, horse coming down. And so um, this horse was here looking for his driver, Pedro, to catch him or me <laughs> to catch him and go hook up to the carriage. And there likewise is my Billy going up the ramp himself. They know where they live, they put themselves away. Um, So I just wanted to also talk about um, the stable, the 52nd Street stable was originally, like I said, the Department of Street Cleaning. Um, because it's a larger stable, it has slightly different horse keeping situations than in the other stables. Stable on 38th Street, when I was talking about being gravity driven, uh, we use shavings to bet on. Um, Stablemen just sweep it out with the manure into the aisle and down. Um, the 52nd Street stable, because it is so much larger to economize, they actually, um, you they bet on straw. And then they give the muck and the straw to a mushroom company, Giorgio Mushrooms in uh, Pennsylvania. Um, and they then compost the mushrooms and <laughs> compost the manure and grow mushrooms on them. 90% of the uh, mushrooms grown on the East Coast are grown by Giorgio Mushrooms. And they have, <laughs> uh, so, and they send out like 10 trucks seven days a week you know, they're going to racetracks, big equestrian facilities, and we provide two of those 70 trucks a week to the mushroom company. So if you've enjoyed a mushroom on the East Coast, you can thank a New York City carriage horse. So, but what this means is that the labor here is, is very labor intensive. Um, our stablemen at 52nd Street muck into these blue barrels, which are then stacked in our manure room which is on the third floor of the building. So we have a freight elevator that instead of gravity bringing everything down, um, the stablemen here have to pick everything up, put it in the barrel, put the barrel and take it upstairs. And then when the manure truck comes, he drives out on the sidewalk, they dump the um, manure into this trap door, which comes out the chute into the truck and away they go. So this is a very, very labor intensive process but because of the logistics and the challenges of being in Manhattan where you don't you can't have an open manure yard um the manure has to be containerized uh you can't just move it around with a backhoe you know outside the building uh you've got to have a place to store it and we the manure gets collected here um twice a week um and then at at 38th street it, private sanitation comes and picks up our dumpsters five days a week. So all these horses, they generate a tremendous amount <laughs> of manure because they're eating a tremendous amount of hay. Um, we have a question from sure. Deanna. Is there a lot of turnover among the stablemen and are they paid well? <laughs> they are paid well. Um, you know, they, um, most of our stablemen are from, from, um, um, Mexico and El Salvador, and um, they're they're paid well. Plus, on top of their job of taking care of the um, horses, I mean, there's we have stablemen there during the day. We have stablemen there overnight. Our horses are never alone. Um, you know, they also get tips from the drivers. Um, you know, if I come in in the morning and I say, "Can you please get my horse ready?" 
you know, he gets a tip from me and he gets a tip from everybody else's horse. He gets ready and helps hook up to the carriage. Um, they also, our stablemen do shoeing. They can reset shoes. They do a lot of carriage repairs and all of this adds to their um, income as well. Like, you know, uh, stable men at my stable, Danny is really good at, you know, fixing bearings and fixing the brakes, you know. And so we do all of this kind of carriage repair in-house, um, fixing floorboards and tires and stuff. So, you know, we our stable men are really important to us. I mean, because we they they they're the you know, they know our horses, they know every horse in the barn, which is really um, incredible um, to us. We don't have a lot of turnover, um, like um, stablemen. We have several stablemen that have been around for 20, 25 years. Um, so it's, we really wouldn't be able to do this without them. They're the first to notice if, if a horse is acting off, um, that there might be a colic or something going on. And so, like I said, we really couldn't do this without them. So, let's see if there's any other questions. Um, okay, so, so kind of then the, you know, that's all the who, what, where, when, where, then there's the how. Um, we are highly regulated. I mentioned these regulations coming in in 1981. Uh, they've been revised in 1989, 2010. We are, people ask, you know, are you regulated? Well, it's New York City. Of course, we're regulated. We're overseen by five city agencies. Uh, primarily is the Department of Health, which oversees the health and welfare of the horses, uh, we have the Department of um, Transportation. It regulates where we can go uh, in the streets. And we have the Department of Consumer Affairs who regulates our rates, who gets a license um, to drive a carriage, you know, um, when we can operate, how much we can charge. Uh, we have the uh, Buildings Department who, of course, inspects our stables. And we have um, the NYPD who included the mounted unit who enforces our temperature restrictions. So um, the carriage horses can only work nine hours out of the day. So from the time they leave stable to the time they get back, um, they can't work if it's too hot or too cold, which in New York City is above 89 degrees or below 19 degrees, or in blizzards, hurricanes, tornadoes, or hail. Um, they have to be blanketed when they are um, waiting in the carriage stands if it's below 40 degrees. Um, you know, carriage, you know, horse people have debates all the time about, you know, to blanket or not to blanket, what weight blanket, under what conditions do you clip, do you blanket, you know, do you leave them natural and shaggy? I um, mean, our horses, we generally leave natural unless they are pushing away and they need to be clipped to, you know, keep, you know, regulate their body temperature. Uh, we leave their natural winter coats, um, but the city has solved this problem for us by saying that when they're standing around doing nothing, they have to have a blanket on over their harness. We take that off when they're moving so they don't overheat. If it's below 55 degrees and raining, they have to wear a raincoat. Um, they have to go on vacation at least five weeks out of the year. Um, I've got four horses in the city and two stalls. So my horses are averaging four to six months vacation. Um, they had to be seen by the vet twice a year, um, both for full examination both times, uh, but also with um, uh, shots at one, another exam. Plus, if they're going out of state to go on vacation, they, of course, have to get a health certificate. So they got another physical exam. Um, so those are just they have to live in box stalls. Like I said, that to be at least eight, you know, 60 square feet. Um, so those are all the kinds of regulations um, that are horses are protected by in the city of New York, um, that a lot of horses elsewhere, there are no rules about in terms of temperature, length of work day. Um, when they're out at work, they have to, every two hours, they have to get 15 minutes rest. Um, you know, they have to be offered food and water throughout the day. We have water troughs up at the park. Um, we talked a little bit about traffic earlier, but a typical day, you know, I come to the stable, 
and I tell the stableman which horse I'm going out with. He helps get the horse groomed and harnessed. Horse comes down, and then we hook him up to the carriage, and I go with my horse, clip, clop, clip, clop through the streets. Um, and then once we're at the park, we park in one of our cab uh, carriage stands, and then we wait um, till we get a ride. And, you know, people ask, well, how many rides do you do in a day? Well, it depends on literally everything. It depends on the season, what time, day of the week it is, uh, what the weather's like, what else is going on in town, whether or not there's a global pandemic, what the exchange rate is. So it's it really depends. Our busiest time of year is between Thanksgiving and New Year's. And then in terms of um, training, uh, we get our horses primarily from Amish and Mennonite communities. Um, in upstate New York and Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Um, we have had other commercial carriage horses come into the business, horses from Chicago who unfortunately lost their jobs. We've had horses come in, um, you know, from Charleston as a second, you know, St. Louis, but um, most of them are farm horses. So I'll give an example of my horse, Sherman, um, who is, So my horse, Sherman, who is a Percheron Morgan Cross, I got him about a year and a half ago. And he was an Amish family's vegetable wagon horse. Like his job was to stand in a field all day while everybody picked vegetables into his wagon. And then when the um, wagon was full, he'd move on to a different spot. And go from there. So here's my boy Sherman. <laughs> um, and then he took the family to church on Sundays. And so because he was traffic safe, he wasn't afraid of the trucks and buses. So that was to me the prime candidate for a carriage horse. He knows how to stand, done a full day's work, and he's not afraid of traffic. So I purchased him. Uh, a lot of times we bring horses into the city on a trial period. We cannot even take them out to go to work and see if they work um, until they've been licensed by the city. They have to get a full vet exam, they have to be registered with the city, and then we can take them out and see if they work. Uh, they're issued a hoof number. That's their license number. That's how the city keeps track of who they are and who they belong to. Sherman is 4461. Um, and, um, you know, he you know, came to work and um, he was really funny. He had stayed in for a couple of weeks because he had to be licensed. He had to be, seen, you know, he had to be seen by the vet. Then he had to be licensed. Then I had shoeing issues on getting the farrier there to get his shoes done. And then it took, um, you know, so during that time we were walking up and down in front of the stable. Like here, Sherman, let's look at the Comic Con folks because we're right next to the Javits Center. So we did that, you know, like, welcome to New York. Let's get a little bit used to it. But it'd taken a while to get up to the park. And then once he got up there, he was like, oh, my gosh, that's where all my friends are. You know, like he was so happy to see them because every day he'd watch them leave the stable. He didn't know where they were going. It was kind of like he got up to the park and he's like, I found them. And he went, he was, he, the other horses were there standing. So he went there and stood there and, um, you know, he went right to work. Um, he's, he's a smart horse. You show him something a couple of times. When you're training a new horse, you've usually got people uh, with you to be on the ground or whatever. But it's literally, it's like, let's go find the cement mixer. Let's go find the garbage truck. Let's go find, you know, construction. Let's go a different way. Let's find, you know, things that, you know, he may not have seen before. And let's see how he's going to react. Because in the carriage business, you want a horse that the first time they see something, their response is not going to be, oh, my God, run for your lives. It's going to be, huh that's interesting. You know, like, let's go see what it is. Um, we haven't had a lot of snow in New York City in the last couple of years. I mean, we've been on a really mild winter. So right around Christmas time, we got the first like sleety snow that we'd had in like two years. And I've only had Sherman for a year and a half. And I was going home and I had taken him out on Central Park West and I saw the salt trucks. And I was like, oh, i forgot about the salt trucks um and sherman saw it too they were coming 
head on. There aren't many two way streets in New York City, but this is one of them. And he's like, what is that? So I pulled over and the salt truck came by and it was kind of spreading the salt, but not really. And so it went by and it was fine. And so Sherman was like, oh, OK. And I'm like, thank goodness it didn't pelt him with the uh, salt. And uh, we get a few blocks further down the street. And here comes another salt truck, bright orange, plow in the front and everything. And Sherman doesn't even look at it because he learned, right? And this salt truck, though, was flinging salt all across the street and it nailed him. And he jumped, you know, and he he was offended. He was like, I thought we were good. I thought, you know, we <laughs> I thought we had an understanding. You know, the last one was fine. So I tell that story just because it's a it's an insight into the way that our horses think and how they get used to being in the city. Um, you know, and now he's going to be a little skeptical of salt trucks, but he also knows that it's not going to eat him. So that's how, you know, they get trained in the city. But it's also evidence that, you know, when we buy horses, you don't really know, you know, you don't really feel fully comfortable with them for for months, you know, because this has been a year and a half is the first time he'd seen it. But he's, he's a very good boy. Um, and then, you know, people ask me, you know, aren't the horses stressed by being in the city? And the answer is no, actually, we did a scientific study to find out. Back in 2017, uh, veterinarian uh, Joe Bertone from Western University, he actually literally was walking in front of the 52nd Street Stable because there's a cruise ship terminal down here. He's from California. And he's like, wait, I smell horses. And he introduced himself to the stable manager. And he went about talking about, you know, nobody does research on carriage horses because we don't have major problems. We're not a very big industry. We're not trying, we don't, there's not a lot of money involved. So there's not like money behind dealing with the orthopedic issues that say race horses and performance horses and show horses look at or other genetic issues and in, in that other breeds might suffer from, uh, you know, breed industry organizations. So there's not a lot of funding for it, but we actually did a cortisol study on carriage horses uh, where they actually sampled cortisol levels um, from the horses before they went to work, when they were going out to work, when they got back from work, after they'd been back at work for a while and when they were on the farm. And what they found was that our horses just have normal cortisol distribution throughout the day there's nothing you know they, they they're about as stressed as you know like a horse that might be getting clipped that's used to getting clipped you know um that they really do not have a stress response to going to work in the city and if anything they have higher cortisol levels when they're on the farm on vacation and now they're having to fight with each other over the round bale and who's going to stand next to who and you know, who's going to go to the water trough and whether or not the other ones are allowed to go with them. So, um, and they're working out their pecking order there. Whereas when they're in the city, there's a routine, everything's normal. Um, so that's uh, something that was published in uh, the journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association in 2017. And is it a good moment now to to ask you what the, the public reaction is usually when you you're out with your horses and oh, yeah so uh, so this is actually a good segue into this because then there's why why do we do this why do we have horses in new york city um so we are a new york city tradition i mean we have been around you know in central park since 1858 we've been featured in movies everything from home alone 2 and elf and and you know sex in the city and um seinfeld i mean who can you can forget Rusty, who was a Philadelphia carriage horse, but that's beside the point, <laughs> the real Rusty. Um, so, but anyway, we're ubiquitous uh, in sort of the, the life of the city. Um, actually, The Daily Show just made reference, you know, they had a little segment of somebody reporting from one of their correspondents reporting from Central Park. And actually, The Daily Show is just right around the corner from us. And when I saw that on The Daily Show, I'm like, are they going to say something about us? And they did, but just in passing, like, this is something you do in Central Park. Um, so in the city, most people in New York love the carriage horses were like, it's like asking, should there be trees in Central Park or should there be pizza stands in New York City? We just are. Um, but 
as people become more disconnected from nature, you know, and from farms and from livestock, we are operating in the public. You know, our horses are at home in the stable, which are subject to city inspections and have, you know, records and everything like that. Uh, but when we're out at work, we're out at work. So everything that can happen to a horse, you know, can happen in the street or in the park. So, you know, horses can go lame, you know, like horses can get sick. There could be horses get loose. Um, you know, all of these things are very infrequent. But when you've got 200 horses and 130, 140 of them are in the city and 68 of them are out at the park at any given time, stuff happens. And everybody has a smartphone. And so everybody can put it on social media. They can put it on TikTok. They can put it on Twitter. The local media picks up on it. And so this is where I come in. You know, like I am the um, you know, spokesperson. I'm the one who gets called when something happens in the media as a question. Um, so that's what we're dealing with. Um, now, when I say that, like, what's the public's reaction? We have, you know, when we were gone for six months for the pandemic, when we came back to work, I mean, we sent all the horses away. I laid in bed when the last horse went out of the stable half block down the street. I'm like, oh my God, what have we done? Is this the first time there haven't been horses on Manhattan? And then I heard clip clop, clip clop, because the police horses are right around the corner. Um, so there have been police, there are police horses kept the street going until we came back. We came back and I had people running down the street because they heard the horses in Hell's Kitchen here. And they're like, oh my gosh, I thought I heard horses. Are you guys back? And like, yeah, I'm like, oh my God, we thought you were going to be gone, you know. And, you know, the pandemic was this huge challenge for us. Um, you know, we had to pay all the expenses on these buildings. You know, we paid to keep our stablemen employed. Um, we actually at 38th Street, we had our stablemen there actually same as always around the clock just to have somebody there to watch the building now and and to, you know, make sure that their families were taken care of during the pandemic. And, you know, there's taxes and mortgages and stuff that have to be paid on all that. So it was it was a tough time for us. And of course, our horses had to be paid for out in Pennsylvania. Um, but. Of course, the animal rights people think that you shouldn't have horses in the city, that horses aren't domesticated animals, that they should be wild and free someplace, um, or that, you know, horses should be, you know, uh, on pasture. They're like, horses should be on pasture, you know, not really understanding or refusing to understand that what's pasture for a horse. It provides mm -hmm. food. Our horses get all the hay that they can eat. And they get grain at the park to supplement their uh, calorie needs. So it's food, it's exercise. So our horses are walking, you know, between two and three miles round trip just to go to the park and back. Plus they're doing loops in the park that are either about a mile or about a mile and three quarters, you know, and they're doing several of those throughout the day. So they're actually getting the mileage that's closer to what a wild horse would get looking for food which between 15 and 20 miles a day we're not even near that we, you know most days we might be in the 10 12 mile range maybe but it's a lot closer in terms of mileage than a horse is standing in a two acre paddock if that or a turnout on long island um you know that's basically a dry lot so so they're getting exercise. And the third thing pasture provides is socialization. And our horses, when they're in their stalls, you know, can see all their neighbors. They can touch each other between the stalls. Um, and then, of course, when they're at the park, they're with all their friends. So they get socialization. So they don't need a pasture. Um, and then they get one when they go on vacation. Um, and so what we've been having to do to fight these animal rights groups. And I, I showed you back at the beginning where our stables are. This is the Hudson Yards. Most, ex, you know, biggest construction real estate development in the world. They call it Dubai on the Hudson. This has been rezoned for 70 stories. Carriage people don't want to sell. We have to have a place to keep our horses. But the real estate people would like for us to sell. 
So they are some of the people that fund these animal rights groups who then take their TikTok videos and um, and publish them and then spread them and try to get introduce legislation to ban us and and all the politics that's involved with uh, just being in New York where, you know, I said the city sets the rates of our fares. They also set all these regulations. That means we're inherently political. Um, and so then why do we do this? We also do this to keep the you know, knowledge of horses and what they can do in urban environments alive. I have AWESOME here. AWESOME is an acronym for a um, organization that TW Look 100 and me as the shop steward started, which that stands for Animal Welfare Education, Supporting Our Metropolitan Equines. It's a heck of an acronym, but horses are awesome. So um, what we do is we bring school kids from New York into the park to get free carriage rides. We bring them to see our stables. Um, this is Jill and her horse, Nick. Um, and I'll just kind of wind up here with a little bit of a clip about what we do. Um, this is um, a trip we had. Can you all hear the uh, sound? Not really well, but... <laughs> They can fluff up their hair or lay it flat in the wintertime, depending on how cold it is. So like when it gets really cold, they fluff their hair up, it traps a layer of air there and it insulates them. So they stay nice and warm. They have friends, they're hungry, and they, they can hear each other like a half a mile away, but they're, they're praying. So if, if you're a horse, you don't really want to be really loud, and then the mouth is like, hey, horse is over there. Yeah. Um, they do make some other noises that like, like one of the friends comes back from work and they're stable and like, they like make a little bit of witty and then like a reading. <laughs> So that's, you know, a little bit of um, why we do what we do is we are there as ambassadors for working horses everywhere, because I encounter people all the time that the very first horse they see in person is a New York City carriage horse um, or a carriage horse in Philadelphia or a carriage horse in Charleston or a carriage horse or, or a horse giving a wagon ride on a, um, you know, at an orchard or whatever, that it's, it's. For most people, these are the first horses they encounter, these working horses, but there's so much misinformation and baggage that goes along with, you know, the, um, that goes along with the harness. You know, everybody has some misremembered thing about Black Beauty, um, forgetting that the best human Black Beauty ever knew was Jerry, the London cab driver, <laughs> you know, <laughs> At least that's in Black Beauty's own words. But um, so that's why we do what we do. You're kind of like the ambassador for also like the ambassador for all the farmers. We still use horses and yeah, us I mean, loggers who still use horses. Yeah, I mean, hey, most people, I mean, I'm standing around doing my job in the park and I'll literally, literally be walked past by hundreds, if not thousands of people a day. Uh, every day and mm -hmm. there's 68 of us and we're all through the park so there's thousands and thousands of people who see us if you're out logging in the woods how many people see you no very Hopefully few people walking. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> um, you know, or plowing in the field. Maybe somebody driving by on the road might see you out there, but it's, um, you know, in terms of like in-person stuff, you know, we're right there and that's, you know, we're on the front lines, I guess you could say. Well, we, we thank you from, from the countryside too. And, um, also like, do you have specific things that you, you keep in check? You know, when I bring my horse in the woods, I don't, I don't think about anybody looking at my horse. So what, yeah. what do you have to make sure? So, I mean, this is, this is, this is the, um, challenge of being in the public. So, um, I mentioned that we are members of TW Local 100. Um, and we are, you know, um, they represent us. I said, I'm the media spokesperson. Um, we have had issues where there's 68 different carriages and there's almost as many carriage owners. And even though we're all subject to the same regulations and we're all keeping our horses in the same stables, there have been horses that have gotten sick so uh, or had an issue. Um, which is going to happen wherever there's livestock, right? Um, but in New York City, everybody sees that. So a couple of years, year and a half ago, August of 2022, there was a horse called Ryder who went viral because he tripped and fell on his way home from work. And it turns out he had gotten skinny. And he'd actually gotten skinny over the course of, you know, just a few weeks, like very quickly. And as any horse person knows, when, you know, a horse gets skinny, you know, you check their teeth, you up their feed, you worm them, you do all these things to try to you know, give them extra feed, um, more hay, more grain, supplement, you know, all the stuff to try to gain weight. Um, and, you know, usually they didn't lose the weight overnight. They don't get it back right away. Well, it turns out this horse was cachexic. He actually had stage four equine lymphoma. Um, it took a month after that incident, he was retired on the spot, took a month after that incident for that to be diagnosed. And unfortunately, stage four equine lymphoma is terminal. Uh, he was humanely euthanized two months after he tripped and fell, but not before he was seen by millions and millions and millions of people around the world. And so it's very hard to explain to people, especially when you don't know exactly what's going on with the horse initially, um, and the media is all and whatever, you know, what's going on. So since then, TW Local 100, we have implemented um, a safety committee. And one of the primary purposes of the safety committee is to keep an eye on all the horses. You know, if there's something that doesn't look right, to talk to the owner, to make sure that like something is addressed before it becomes a problem, because we are constantly in the public eye. Um, we you know Dr. Cook, I mentioned him earlier from um, um, New England Equine. He's in the stable every two weeks. He is uh, all, in all the stables. He is on the safety committee. So he is there to walk through the stables, to look at horses that might have an issue, just to give feedback. Uh, we've also brought in a guy named Tristan Aldrich, who is a um, driving horse expert. Um, so he's worked for the queen of England at the Royal Muse, but just as somebody else besides who's outside the business, you know, I mean, I've been doing this for 18 years, but I certainly don't know everything there is to know. And when you work with people who also have been doing this for a long time and who also own their own carriage and also own their own horses, sometimes it can be a little bit hard for me to tell one person what to do. Um, and they'll say, well, that's not, that's in my horse. But to bring somebody who's outside the business in to say like, your horse looks like he's a little lame um, or he looks like he's a little stiff or he dropped a little weight from the last time I saw him last week. So, you know, we've we've done that because we are, like I said, in the forefront of the public eye at all times and everybody has a phone in their pocket and everybody has a way to, um, you know, put out pictures and videos um, that, you know, they can caption however they want. Um, you know, so that's what we're here for too, is to try to respond to that and, and to prevent things also just to be an explainer. Um, when I first started in this business in New York city in, um, 2012, 
um, my friend Steve Malone, he was the kind of president of the Horse and Carriage Association. He was a union rep. Um, he had just started working with other equine groups, um, the New York State Horse Council, you know, um, the AAP, stuff like that. He had started to form these alliances like we're doing here now with uh, with uh, DAPNET and everything. Um, but before then, you know, we were kind of on our own. And the response to the carriage people, to the media, was a closed stable door. You know, and I don't know what started came first, the chicken or the egg. But at some point in the 1970s or 80s, some media outlet wrote something that the carriage people thought was wasn't fair and didn't represent them well. And so they said, we're not going to talk to the media. And then when they didn't talk to the media, then the media wrote stories that were based entirely on what the anti-carriage PETA people, animal rights people said which then made the carriage people feel that the media wasn't being fair to them. So they weren't going to talk to them because you couldn't trust them. And this circle got to the point that, you know, it, when I came along, you know, I talked to anybody in the media. Um, I arguably talked to the media too much, you know, like, but the worst thing you can say to the media is no comment. And so we had a high profile carriage accident Somebody dropped a load of scaffolding off the back of a truck in 2012, spooked a horse, horse ran through Columbus Circle, carriage hit some vehicles, carriage broke, passengers kind of tumbled out, they hit some scrapes and bruises, they were fine. Their neighbors later came for a carriage ride like two years later, knowing that their friends had been in a carriage accident. Um, but the horse ran through the streets, uh, his name was Oreo, not my Oreo, and he stopped at a red light and um, was caught by a bystander. And then the police came and all kinds of other things happened. The horse ended up being tied up cor incorrectly. He ended up, instead of thrashing at the end of an incorrect tie up by the lines, he uh, ended up lying down. But he ended up, because he was hamstrung, uh, but by the, by the police. And, um, but all those, pictures and videos and carriage pieces all went, you know, all over the place. And it happened on the slowest news day of the year. And um, I had been working in the business for literally about nine, about nine days. <laughs> and uh, and um, it happened. And next thing you know, I'm on TV during my night shift, driving around to the news trucks to be like, hey, do you want to talk to a carriage person? And the look on the media's faces of like, really? I'm like, yeah, I'll talk to you about it. And then next thing you know, they're out at the stable at 7 a.m. the next morning, but like, we're here reporting from outside the stable where Oreo, who was involved in this carriage accident, is supposedly inside. They say that he's not injured, but like, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, the animal rights people are calling for a ban on carriage horses. And I got a phone call. The media is outside. I'm like, hang on, I'll be there. And uh, you guys want to come inside and see the horse? And that day we had every news outlet in New York City inside the stable. And of course they were there to see Oreo. They got to pet him and give him carrots and see that he was fine. But while they were there, they also got to see our box stalls, our automatic waterers, our sprinkler systems. They got to meet the stablemen. They got to see how the whole, it was like, you weren't getting out of there without a stable tour. And I mean, we had every TV outlet, all the major newspapers, some of the minor ones too, sometimes twice on the news. And that really changed things for us because now the media couldn't just report what the animal rights people said, which is that our stables are filthy, that the stalls are too small for the horses to turn around and lie down in, um, that there's no ventilation. They saw all our fans and exhaust systems and windows and everything. Um, they seen for themselves. And now they couldn't report that without it being checked. So, I mean, that kind of, transparency is what it takes sometimes to, um, you know, get the word out to get people to actually pay attention because you can't have a seat at, as Shirley Chisholm said, if, if you don't have a seat at the table, table bring a folding chair. Uh, but it's like, if you don't have a seat at the table, bring a horse and show people the horse, you know, so. Um, 
I'm I'm seeing the time now, and I I'm hoping we can answer some questions too yeah. from other people than me. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, I keep rambling on, but oh my god, that's why we're having you on this DAP chat. <laughs> this is perfect. But I'm just wondering if anyone wanted to ask you a question. I mean, it can or... be anything from like big philosophical questions about working horses in the city uh, to nitpicky things about what kind of shoes we wear. Our horses wear, I wear Ariats, but what kind of shoes our horses wear? If anyone's too shy, I have a list of questions. Oh, most do most drivers, drivers have multiple horses? Sorry. <laughs> most drivers have multiple horses. So in a way, our business is really inefficient um, because we have 68 licenses, those medallions that I was talking about. And each medallion is essentially a small business. And if you have a medallion in the city at one of those three stables, you have to rent two stalls upstairs. So you got to pay board for two horses. So it, and the horses can only work nine hours out of the day and, you know, they get tired or they need to see the ferry or whatever. So, um, you know, you have two horses in the city, they might alternate shifts, either day shift, night shift, or they might alternate days um, there's different ways of doing it, depending on how you want to run your small business. And then your horses have to go on vacation. So either you're going to have one horse away and one in the city, in which case that horse is the only horse you've got. And if they go lame or they need to get shoes or they are overdue for a vet inspection, then you've got no horse. Or you can have horses on vacation. So the kind of optimal number is three. So you have two in the city and one away. So they just rotate. Um, some people will borrow horses from each other for vacation shifts, but not a whole lot. Um, you know, like I have four. And so I've got two on the farm and two in the city. I have a lot of horses, but two of mine are getting older. Uh, King's 25 and Billy's 21. So they could need to retire soon. So it's good to have extra horses because it's better to shop for a horse when you don't need one than when you're desperate for one. Um, so those are, those are, that's, most people, but you know, like I was just saying, it's not necessarily very efficient because if you know, I've got two horses and one on the farm, so three horses for two spots, you know, you could have that's a 50% excess, or me with four got 100% excess. Whereas if you're operating a fleet of carriages, then you might have 20 carriages, but 25 horses, so or 22 horses. So it's, you know, it's a little bit inefficient, but it's it's the way that we are in this business because it comes out of the cab business. So uh, I can see the questions over here. What kind of feed and hay do you feed? Um, generally speaking, the horses get free choice hay. Um, so basically the stablemen come around multiple times a day, fill up the hay rack. So they're never without food for, without hay for very long when they're at the stable. Um, just generally a um, mixed grass hay, you know, Timothy orchard grass, usually from upstate New York. Um, at 38th Street, we feed small bales. At 52nd Street, because they've got the freight elevator, they feed the big, you know, 800-pound bales and take a flake and fold it over and put it in the hay rack. Um, in terms of the feed, the grain is up to the individual carriage owner. So the stablemen at the stable do all the haying and the watering and the mucking, um, but they don't do grain because you can screw up the grain. And uh, when there's 90 horses horses have different diets and stuff. Uh, at 52nd Street, they keep both um, a sweet feed that comes from a grain mill and comes in thousand pound bags and is in a hopper or in a silo. Um, and then a, a senior feed like a pelleted grain. Um, and those, I, they come when the hay comes and when the manure guy comes, he brings it and takes it. Um, and basically they get fed while they're at work. Um, they get their grain while they're at work in between rides. That way their stomachs are never empty. So they, we don't have as much problems with things like ulcers as some other feeding regimens. Um, and then they eat when they're at work. So they um, get the calories that they're burning through doing the work. Um, generally, a you know, 12% sweet feed. At 38th Street, we just do 50 pound bags of a neutrina you know, a uh, pelleted sweet feed type thing. Um, 
Oh, so are there concerns about traction in the winter and what sort of shoes do the horses wear? Um, our horses go in road shoes. So they're steel uh, with either Borium or Drill Tech cleats on the toe and the heels. Um, and sometimes the quarters, depending on how much traction we're looking for. Um, the They're getting shot every four to six weeks. Um, I think by law, we can't go more than eight. Um, but it's usually four to six weeks, depending on how much work you're doing, uh, how many miles the horse is getting, how the horse walks. Like I have a horse that if he's doing a lot of miles, he's always, he'll wear down his, he scrapes his feet in the back. So he'll wear down um, that Borium or Drill Tech in the back. Um, in terms of traction in the winter, if anybody's been to Charleston, you've seen that the horses in Charleston wear Bermuda tires, which are the big steel shoe with a big, like nearly inch rubber um, rim around it. And we can't do that in New York City, even if we wanted to. Um, there's debate about it because the those rubber shoes don't allow the hind feet to slide. So it can kind of cause a little bit of a grab there that can cause some joint issues, but it does offer concussive things and it's easier on the streets. We wear grooves in the park and the asphalt because that borium and on the steel shoe, the borium is harder than the asphalt. Um, so the horses do wear grooves where they go over and over and over again. They've worn grooves in the cement floors at the stable. Um, we So they don't necessarily need rubber for um, concussion purposes. Um, the asphalt itself has a little bit of give. If you ever talk to a jogger, they'll tell you they'd rather run on asphalt than on concrete. Our horses are on asphalt. It was designed for horses to walk on. They started paving Fifth Avenue here in New York with asphalt in 1872. Uh, they started paving the park in the 1880s. Um, so we can't do rubber because we get ice. Uh, we do have some horses that go in those rubber shoes in the front for orthopedic reasons, uh, therapeutic reasons. But in the wintertime, we have to change them out to steel shoes or they have to go on vacation. Um, because the minute you get any ice with the rubber, they're sliding. But the but the, the drill tech of the Borium has got good traction. Um, and that will be our last question. Oh, there's one about how hard is it to get insurance? I'll just answer that because that's a good one. We, um, because we're 68 operators and we've been doing this in the city for a long, long time, even when somebody buys a medallion off of somebody else. So that's like, how do you get into the business if you want to own a carriage? I personally don't own a carriage. I work for a family that's had a carriage for 48 years, um, 49 years in the business. Um, and I basically run the family business. Um, three of the horses belong to my boss, Sal. He's inherited them. Sherman's my horse, uh, but they all work on the carriage. But you know, they, they have a policy that they've had for decades. But if I went and bought a carriage, you know, I know that a lot of carriage operators have a hard time getting insurance because they're new. But because we've been in existence as a business for a long time, it gives the insurance agents an idea of what it is that we do and who's operating in it and what regulations we have. We're required to uh, carry a million dollar liability insurance. And I can insure the carriage for less than I pay for car insurance in New York State. So that gives people an idea both about, um, uh, you know, relative risk of what the insurance company thinks is dangerous, you know, because you'll say, how isn't it dangerous to drive the streets? Well, the insurance company doesn't think so. Um, they're not in the business of losing money. Um, so. I know it's a big issue in the car commercial carriage world. Uh, people have been had their policies dropped. They're having a hard time getting new insurance policies. It can be very expensive and it is expensive. Our policies have gone up a bunch in the last couple of years, but we're in business. This is what we do is how we pay the rent. So unfortunately it's the price that we end up uh, paying. Well, thank you so much, Christina. I think that was really, really, really helpful. I hope a lot everybody in learned I learned so much I think every word you said was new for me <laughs> so 
I um, just want to say like, you know, like we, we haven't really done like a true open house in a while, but we do sometimes give stable tours. And obviously if anybody were to reach out to me and say, Hey, I'm with DAPNET. We're going to be in the city. Can we come see the stables? I'd be happy to show you guys around. So, you know, that's, um, you know, I do that a lot. I said, we, we've had, the, we've been bringing school kids into the stables and stuff like that too. But it's, it's, I mean, it's not an open door policy. Like the one thing the stable manager hates is if we make more work for the stableman because I've got random people showing up being like, hey, I want to see the stable. We don't know who you are. But if you reach out to me, I can, if you're in the city, I'd be happy to show you guys where the horses are. Definitely writing this down. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, we'll have to close it now because I think our Zoom link is going to expire. So, but thank you so, so, so much. And this will be available on YouTube um, for anybody to watch. Okay. <laughs> so, have a good night. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, guys. Oh, I got the end button. <laughs> yeah.